Where does wealth start? Well, that's a question that we are talking about on today's episode of the Hard Thing Podcast. Welcome back again, friends, to this show, the Hard Thing Podcast. I'm your host, Justin Lewis, and I'm here to help you improve your life by facing whatever challenge you're facing in your life right now, and in the process, learn how to conquer any challenge that comes to you or that you choose. Uh, Today, we have an awesome guest. His name is Andrew Hallam. He has been... uh, He's been termed the millionaire teacher, and today we talk a lot about finance and really the mentality of finance and what it takes deep down. We also talk about dealing with medical issues such as cancer and keeping your emotional self steady during hard times like that. Uh, It's a great conversation. Also, Andrew recently wrote a a book called Balance, uh, which I, in reading it, I really enjoyed it. It has challenged a lot of the ways I think about life in general and money and where I want to be. So I encourage you to think about those things as you listen up to my conversation with Andrew Hallam while we talk about doing hard things and overcoming average. All right. Well, thank you for coming on the show, Andrew. Thank you for coming on the Hard Thing Podcast and joining me here and having this conversation with me. That was my pleasure, Justin. Thank you for the invite. Yeah. Uh, Let's jump in. Let me ask you the question that I ask every single guest. Andrew, what's the hardest thing you've ever done? Hey, how many guests have like an an answer right off the bat before I, before I get into this? Like (laughs) it's such a good question. I think some of the viewers would probably be, or the listeners would probably be thinking about that. Like, Hmm, what is the hardest thing I've ever done? Uh, Does it take sometimes a little bit of time for people to think about that? Generally. What I've seen is that usually either it comes immediately or it comes after a second and the guest kind of talks a second and then solidifies their answer or they kind of qualify their answer. And I've had, I had one guest say the long, the hardest immediate thing I've dealt with was this day. The hardest short-term thing I dealt with was this and the hardest lifetime thing that I've dealt with was this and kind of qualified it in that way. But Like I said, I enjoy asking that question and and letting you answer it in any way you like, because, you know, you get, you get things you don't expect. Like I've had, I had a Navy SEAL say that the hardest thing he did was parenting. And I've had uh, another one say that um, the hardest thing was dealing with the death of a son. And uh, I don't know, it's, it's a very personal question. So hopefully, hopefully I don't put you on the spot too much, but yeah. No, not at all. No, that's life, isn't it? It's just for every single one of us is filled with challenges and speed bumps along the way and yeah. things that sometimes derail us completely and take us, wipe us right off the path. And then the idea of course is, is to get back onto that path. Right. Um, and I would, I would say, uh, I would say for me, it was probably getting a cancer diagnosis. Um, so it was kind of, a. Uh, I mean, to say it, it hit me out of the blue is one of those things that is almost a cliche with cancer because nobody expects it. And everybody says, well, it's not, it's not ever going to happen to me. So I was physically fit, uh, low stressed. I mean, so I didn't really have any of the lifestyle markers that are associated with it. I don't, I don't smoke, never did smoke. Um, I don't like alcohol, so I never did drink. Uh, I'm fit and I and I, I sleep really well. So I'm sort of a low stress dude. And so the idea that I would get cancer right after winning um, was probably Singapore's biggest running race. So I was living in Singapore and they have a, a race with uh, 15,000 people every year called the JP Morgan Corporate Challenge. And I ended up winning it outright. I was the oldest winner in the race's history. I was 38 years old. And so that was, that's pretty old for a relatively short event. It was, uh, it was a 5.6 kilometer event. The origin of it was based on a race that was held in, I believe, Central Park in New York. And then JP Morgan started to have the same sorts of races, or at least that same distance all over the world. So all of these different cities would have it. So there'd be one in Los Angeles and Frankfurt and Singapore and just everywhere. And I'd been trying to win it for years. And and always done really well, uh, but had never actually crossed the winner's tape until uh, until I was 38. 
ironically. So won this won this race and then had some routine scans done shortly thereafter, and it was discovered that I had uh, bone cancer in three of my ribs. So I had to have those removed, and the cancer was also coming in towards the vertebral column, and so that was a, a that was that was pretty frightening obviously to go in and, and I felt physically fine too, Justin, that was the strange thing. I had no, um, no side effects. No, I'd had no, obviously I had no weakness physically. I mean, I just won this crazy race and then I'm told, wow, um, we've got to get this out now. Cause if this goes into your spinal area, you're, you're done. It's over. Uh, so, <laughs> so I had to have that, so that, that was tough. What well, was probably even tougher was during the rehabilitation when, and I think it really was excessive scar tissue as a result of the surgery, when I went into an MRI and they wanted to have a look to see, they actually were talking about how, uh, they wanted to see how, how it was healing. And they found a lot of inflammation and figured that that was cancer and it was back. So they called me at work and you know I got a phone call. I'm teaching a bunch of students. And I, I pick up the phone and they, uh, the doctor said to me, the surgeon said to me, you know, it's, it's back and it's really bad. It was only you know, a handful of months after my, my initial diagnosis and then my surgery. So yeah, that was pretty hard. I would say, um, trying to think, well, I guess this is the end. And the one thing I'm, I'm actually quite happy with how I, how I responded to it. Um, because you, you just don't know how you're going to respond to these things. Nobody knows how somebody can say to me, you know, Andrew, or ask me, Andrew, how would you respond if you, you know, lost the use of your legs? And I could try to say how I might handle it, but honestly, no one has a clue until they've been through something, you know, whether that is, you know, regardless of what that is or what that challenge is, until we actually face that moment, we don't really know how we're going to respond. But I remember distinctly thinking, uh, and this is the part I was just really blessed and happy with, is that I, I thought, well, I'm 38 and I never lived in a war-torn society. I've never experienced hunger. I've had people that love me my, my whole life, people who've supported me and people I could support. And life in itself is so darn unpredictable. For me to say, why me, or ask that question was kind of, I felt kind of arrogant because, or unfair because, you know, it was just a handful of years before when a massive tsunami took out so many villages in Thailand and Sri Lanka. And there were just thousands and thousands of people who were killed, when children who were killed and you know, you go into an oncologist's office and going in there for treatment or whatever, and you, you see children hooked up to chemotherapy and you're thinking, you know, I have no right to say why me or to ask that question. You know, it's just, it's just one of those things. It's just life. And if you can overcome it, uh, and if you're fortunate enough to overcome it, um, I think that's the most important thing and do your best to, to carry on with whatever it is that you have, whatever hand that you've been dealt, you do the best that you can with that hand. I think the first thing that struck me about your experience was you, you didn't say dealing with cancer. You didn't say surviving cancer. What you said, a cancer diagnosis. And I think at least from an outside perspective, that more than anything can probably be, I can imagine the fear and the, you know, just this cloud of mist and darkness kind of laying before you in a metaphorical way of just unknown. And I can, I can easily see how that, you know, obviously that's the beginning of a larger struggle, but that moment, I, I really liked how you described a cancer diagnosis because it just took me you know, to the doctor's office, getting the news. And you're right, though, with what you said about you just don't know how you're going to respond to these things. Um, I've seen that personally in my life recently. And I think um, kind of tying into what you're saying about we don't have, 
I mean, we have the right to ask, but it's not the right thing to ask why me. Um, I, in your book, I was reading the chapter about gratitude and it, it spoke to me a lot because you're right uh, about the fact that, <clears throat> you know, I was born in America. I did nothing to deserve that, but that's like winning the lottery in the world. Uh, so many blessings. I, my parents loved me and supported me growing up. I did nothing to deserve that. I probably did the opposite, you know, um, and uh, we really do have so many things to be grateful for and asking why me is kind of a, you know, it's a, it's a fruitless endeavor rather than just being happy for what we have and maybe trying to share it a little bit with those around us. So thank you for sharing that experience. And hopefully I didn't bring up <laughs> too many difficult memories with getting something like that. Obviously, you know, you're just coming off a huge win. Your spirits are high and, uh, going in for a routine checkup, which becomes anything but routine. How did you cope with that diagnosis and move forward? I, I looked at, I looked at the future. I guess I tried to plan things out. I mean, there are things that I can control and there are things that I cannot control. And the only thing I truly in that circumstance, the only thing I can control is my attitude. So I recognize that really early on. And so I thought, all right, let's, let's actually make plans for things like, like a rehabilitation schedule. Like this is what I want to be trying to do at these given points in time. And so I wrote down like a, a literally a, a physical rehab schedule. When I, when, you know, when they go in with a saw into your spinal area um, and they were taking out parts of the vertebral column, they don't know whether you're going to walk again. And, you know, coming out of a surgery like that is so, uh, obviously it's, it's debilitating in the very beginning, you're in a wheelchair and you're trying to walk eventually. And just whole process of, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to walk now. And I set a goal to walk like 100 yards and then, and I wrote the stuff down. Like I, phys I wrote it down in a, in a journal. So I looked at the things that obviously I can't control these things. I could control my, pers my perspective. Um, but I tried to look to the future to actually making physical improvements that I thought I could make. And I think that was one of the, one of the things that kept me moving forward and eventually putting together like, you know, a full rehab program with a physiotherapist going there and, and trying to go beyond that too. And eventually I, I set a goal to run again. So I was thinking, I was thinking beyond the illness. And I think if you focus so much on the illness itself, that can be something that completely drags you down. So there's like this belief that I'm going to get through this. And so you have to believe that. You have to do what you can to believe that, to stay as positive as possible. And there's such a strong mind-body connection with positivity as well and healing. And that doesn't mean that you know, there aren't completely miserable people who you know, end up beating crazy illnesses. Uh, and, and, and on the flip side, incredibly positive people who get a, a diagnosis that it shouldn't be light threatening, but ends up taking them out. I'm not to say that doesn't happen, but but we do know that a positive outlook it does enhance our abilities to heal. I would add also having a positive outlook probably makes things a little bit more fun, um, just across the board. Uh, you know, we all have been there on a bad day when we turn on really sad music just to make ourselves even more sad, but. Um, we, we probably remember more or, or appreciate more of those days when we put on happy music and we were just happy, even if it was a bad day, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right there for sure. Um, I, I think that kind of what you just described, looking past the illness and, and obviously having this overarching goal, but creating these smaller goals that lead up to it and believing that there is life outside of or after this challenge. 
is, is a really good analogy for also dealing with financial matters. You know, I can imagine, I can, I can think of someone in debt kind of dealing with debt the same way someone might at least mentally or emotionally deal with their illness in a way. And, and uh, that's not to say that someone with an illness is overcoming something or whatever. Sometimes you're just surviving, right? But uh, I think that's really fascinating. So I wanted to ask, do you think kind of your 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 training in the financial area and your kind of self-discipline and, and, and your perspectives there helped prepare you somewhat to maintain this positive attitude while you were dealing with cancer? I would say that, you know, more than anything, it was probably sports growing up as a kid. And and I think that having and setting physical goals for sports was what helped me both with the cancer and setting the goals there looking forward and with the finances going forward too, because it was just a, a natural transition for me. And some people will be really, really good at school and they'll be really goal oriented with that. For me, especially in high school, I wasn't great at school. I wasn't interested in school, but I was really into bicycle road racing. And where I lived, there weren't a lot, there were, there were bike racers there. There wasn't a lot of coaching. So I had to do a lot of reading. I had to read a lot on um, training physiology and put together programs by myself and do a lot of training on my own. Occasionally, I was able to train with other cyclists, but we didn't have a lot of riders. And, uh, and I ended up doing quite well in winning, winning a lot of races. But it was that discipline, I think, that looking beyond and trying to systematically set plans for the future. And also, you know, you'll get setbacks, you'll get injuries, you'll get illnesses. And that was all, I don't know, it was microcosmic in the sense that it was training for life. Because that's what life does. It knocks you on your butt and you have to be able to get up and then plan again, moving forward. And the you know, my rehab thing with cancer, you know, my wife's behind me around. She's probably just laughing because there were times when I bit off more than I could chew. And that's a reality with any goals that people are trying to achieve, whether that's an academic goal or whether that's a financial goal. Occasionally, you know, that happens and we get knocked on our butts and we have to start again and reassess and say, okay, you know, where, where are we? So there were, there were times when with that cancer rehab, uh, I caused myself a little bit of damage by pushing a little bit too hard. And then I had to reassess back off, um, and then move forward. So, yeah. Can I just say, uh, two things? Uh, it's, it's probably a good thing that your wife is behind you laughing. Cause there's that quote, you know, behind every successful man, there's a woman behind him laughing or rolling <laughs> her eyes or whatever. So that must say something about you being successful. Um, but I think one key thing that you just said was, you know, you maybe push yourself too hard or, or, or even damage yourself a little bit, but then you reassess and you try again. And uh, I know some people personally that, you know, this last year they've had multiple surgeries and they might have pushed themselves too hard. And now they're, instead of reassessing and trying again, they're not doing that for fear of pushing themselves too hard again. So I think the reassessment and, and kind of backing off and finding that calibrated, this is the perfect step that I should take, not too much, not too little. I think that was a huge aspect of what you just said that people maybe somewhat overlook. Yeah, I think so. It's like benchmarking. It's like looking at where am I right now? What am I able to do right now? What's my situation currently? Okay, so whatever it is currently, let's incrementally just try to make it a little bit better. Oh, that's so powerful. And, and that actually ties back to, in your book, you mentioned that if we are living next to people who make way more than we are, we're probably going to be unhappy because we're kind of comparing ourselves to them subconsciously. Uh, this principle of what's the perfect next step for me to take, you know, not too much, not too little. I think that goes very well uh, with financial knowledge of understanding your situation, not comparing yourself to other people, but maybe comparing yourself to, to yourself, even though it's bound to happen, we're, we're bound to compare ourselves to other people. Um, but that was one thing I really liked about your book. And kind of in general, at least what I've read so far is that it, <laughs> you'd think that a financial book would start off talking about money, but instead it talks about perspective and values. And I think that's one key thing that a lot of people really miss in their financial literacy education is 
you got to figure out what you value and, and, and what's important to you before you start spending money. Yeah, it's, you know, to me, when I wrote that book, um, and I titled it Balance, just because I, I saw success as like four legs of a table. And, and you have one leg, which is obviously financial. So you have to have some money um, to keep, you know, roof over your head and enough money for health and enough money for food and enough money left over to do interesting things. Your relationships are also key. That's another leg of that table. Uh, your health is important. And I don't mean you have to, everybody has to be an Olympian, <laughs> but to do what you can to somehow maintain the health you have or improve it a little bit. So always keeping that in mind, the progress associated with health. And then the final was uh, the sense of purpose. And I think just talking about money and investing in a vacuum is is strange because it's like focusing on a single leg of a table. And we do know that when it comes down to life satisfaction, all of the research, all of the research says that number one, the most important component to life satisfaction is your relationships. And sometimes we get so focused on the money aspect that you know people end up working far, far too hard, spending too much time thinking about money. But we research suggests too, we become we become generally a lot less charitable when we're completely focused on our own net worth. So although there are people like Warren Buffett who have billions of dollars, who give away billions of dollars every year, the research on the, the generosity and kindness of people who focus a lot on money is compelling. So we do need to have some kind of, of balance with respect to to money and then overall life satisfaction. And in the book, I talk about life satisfaction. And I, I ask that question, well, why is it that you're doing what you're doing? So whatever it is that you're doing or purchasing, when I ask a question, why? why? So why do you want that really expensive car? Like what's the purpose of that? And if you keep asking why, inevitably people will say, well, it just makes me feel good. Like I want it, it'll make me feel good. But the research on that suggests that there's something called hedonic adaptability, whereby when we purchase something, at first, we're really excited about it. So it's like a, a short-term sugar fix. But then eventually, whatever it is that we're buying, whether it's that new car or the upgraded phone or a fancy purse, it just becomes another car, phone, or purse after a few weeks. So we get used to what we own. And so the idea of us, and what's really important is that we get off the consumption treadmill. And what's difficult is when we see so many people around us who are on that treadmill, and we actually think they're happier as a result, but material acquisitions do not make us happier based on the research. So to me, that's why you know a true holistic view, a true sense of balance financially is really important. One thing I, I kind of realized as you were talking is that I think we also um, get used to things faster as we go grow older. You know, I remember as a kid, um, I you know, Friday nights with friends, you go to the store and you're planning a movie night, you get all this candy or whatnot, and then you go home and you have this awesome time, and then you try and replicate that as the years go by, and and hmm. later and later, and it's just not as fun. So I think um, you can even see that in in somewhat experiences if you're not focusing on, like you said, building the relationship and, and rather just enjoying things as the experience. I don't know if that works entirely well. Um, with your charitable comment, I thought that was rather fascinating, especially because in the book, you talk about how we, in, we, I guess the giver benefits more from charity when they actually see kind of the fruits of their efforts um, I, I also kind of thought that that might be something hard to kind of do every, or at least maybe with your money all the time. What are some tips you found to maximize your, your, uh, and I, this sounds super shallow, but your, your charitable giving, not necessarily in a, a financial way, but just kind of all around. I think the, like the, the social, the pro-social element has to be there for me. So I 
I mean, we'll back up and talk about what the research suggests. The research suggests that those that give to charity do end up feeling better about themselves and they actually end up as a result. And it affects us on a, on a physiological cellular level too. When we do studies on the physiology and take blood tests and such and check people's blood pressures um, after they've given, after they've donated, they end up more physically robust as a result. It's almost like we're truly meant to be generous. We're meant to share. It's like, it's, it's part of, of what we are. And they, the part that, uh, what the research suggests on pro-social giving, being the most powerful where you're actually connected, that Justin for me is where I notice it, where I'm far more apt to give when I can actually see the results via the recipient. So if I can actually see, you know, who it is I've helped or I've, I've connected with them in some way rather than, you know, and I don't think it's bad to just give to the United way at all, but it just becomes a, a check or a money transfer and you don't end up actually seeing the result of, of what it is you're doing. But when you can see that result, I think it's, I think it's pretty cool. So have there have been some circumstances where I've, I've helped some people and it's an incredible feeling knowing and seeing what you built. Um, even when, you know, there was a, an organization in Cambodia that I became involved in, we were donating money and we were building houses for people. And it was, it was a really cool thing because we were, it wasn't just charity. The woman that was organizing it, would go into a village and she'd want to see who are the people who are one struggling and two really respected as hardworking, good people. So she would ask questions in the village. She would say, who's, who's having a tough time and who's just really hardworking and a really good person. And all of these people were poor. And so nobody went, well, me, me, I need the money. You know, they, they pointed to different people, but there were some common denominators there. There were a lot of the same people that people are going, yeah, Joe over there. Joe's had a really tough, tough time. He lost his leg to a landmine. He lost his wife and he's raising three kids by himself. And he's a great guy and he works super hard. And so what this woman would do is she'd go to Joe and she'd say, okay, Joe, you know, you work in this, in the rice paddy here. Um, and what we want you to do is to try and save a little bit of money. And there was a process there where Joe didn't really understand anything about like the whole concept of saving, but she'd say, I want you to save money and I want you to be able to buy your own pig. And we're going to come back in a couple of months. And so they'd come back in a couple of months. And if Joe had his pig, they'd say, okay, Joe, now what we want you to do is we want you to save up a little bit of money for this. So there would be these little steps along the way. And eventually they'd say to him, like you, you complete these steps, which are empowering because our person, Joe is going to feel awesome about, actually achieving something and not just receiving something free. But at the end, the idea is that we build Joe a house and house is really relative. Like these are people that have to, they have to fix their house after every monsoon season because, you know, they've got literally mud shacks. And so you know, we ended up having these like garden sheds on stilts is really what you might want to call them. But these people love them. This guy like Joe is just absolutely thrilled to bits. So when I was when I was you know, donating money to that, we were actually going to Cambodia when we would see and help with the building of these houses. It was super powerful. And what it did though, Justin, is it kind of extended where I knew what was happening with that organization. I loved what was happening with that organization. And later when they started raising funds to build wells, and I knew that $120 or $150 would build a well that would service three families in that region of Cambodia. And I knew the region, I'd been there, I'd seen the people, I'd worked with the people. I was really, really happy to send those checks. And I knew where that money directly was going because I had actually been there, I'd seen those families. And I knew that there were all kinds of waterborne illnesses that people were getting from, kids were getting, kids were getting sick just from really crappy water. And with a, for 150 bucks, you could, you could drill a well that would service three families. That was awesome to me. Um, and there was one year where I just uh, 
I was, I was working and my boss said to me, can you take on this extra? I was, I was teaching, can you take on this extra class? And I was already working full time and, and it was a tough job as it was. And I had to take on another, another 20%. And I could have said no, but what was inspiring to me wasn't so much the money, but it was figuring out that if I gave all of that money to build wells in Cambodia, if I gave every penny of that extra money to build wells, and I knew that when I was going in and I was tired, I knew where that money was going, that would lift my spirits, get me through the day. And honestly, it was the best, it was the best thing. It was the best feeling. So I've been excited to give like, you know, financial seminars as well, where I've taken the proceeds of the monies that would be coming towards me and just directed them said, don't pay me. Um, we started a foundation with some friends in Cambodia called Cambodia's Future Foundation, where we paid for some education. We paid for, we selected a bunch of kids who were about 15 years old, and we ended up encouraging them to achieve small goals along the way again. So it was this process of empowering them. And then we paid for them to have uh, college educations in Cambodia. And so you know, it was cool to be giving, I'd give a financial seminar and say, okay, don't pay me, but I want you to direct the money to uh, Cambodia's future foundation, stuff like that, that you're actually connected with is powerful. We went to Cambodia and we chose those kids and we walked into those schools and we put kids through a series of, of tests, intellectual tests. We had some um, Cambodians who actually helped us with that. Uh, and then we asked the kids about, um, about character. We asked, the kids in the school, who do you trust? Like, you know, write down the names of the kids you trust. Who would you, you go to if you had a problem? Who would be helpful to you? Who's got tons of integrity? And so we tried to look at the commonalities between the kids who are working hard, doing pretty well in school. Um, obviously they were poor. This was a re really extremely poor region and someone that had integrity that other kids liked and respected. So, you know, get, giving money to those entities to those people in that capacity justin was for me personally so much better than just writing a check to an organization or sending money to an organization i i don't personally get i wish i got a lot out of that but i actually don't <laughs> uh, i think when i was reading your book i didn't completely understand the concept as well as when you just explained it now the, the goal in you know giving in a charitable way whether that's through actions financial means or otherwise um obviously it, it's it is to help other people but it's also to build that connection with other people or or with meaning so i think maybe a key if, for anyone listening out there if you give to a, a a charitable organization and you don't necessarily feel the impact go and understand the impact go and connect with the processes and the people who are suffering that you are helping and, and kind of get to know them. And I think that might be a very good way of validating maybe what you're doing or, or, or helping you remember the purpose for why you started giving that money charitably in the first place. Um, that's just my hypothesis, maybe. <laughs> um, I kind of want to switch topics. We haven't talked <laughs> very much about money. I mean, we have, but it's kind of mostly been, uh, I don't know, it, it's been really good. But um, one thing that I'm really curious about is your perspectives are somewhat, not necessarily completely, but in certain ways, slightly contrary to popular culture, which is um, obviously a good thing because it you know brings about results. Um, so how did you kind of develop your principles of financial literacy for yourself or kind of how did that process look like? I was, so I grew up in a family that we didn't have a lot of money. We, we had enough. My dad was a mechanic and there, there were four kids. And when I look back now, I really see why it was important for my mom to stay home and not work when we were really young. And she would be there to, to support us and to, you know, to care for us. And so there wasn't a lot of money in our family and so i had to work for everything from a really young age so if i by the time i was able to deliver newspapers 
um, you know, if I wanted a pair of shoes, that was on me. Like I had to buy my, my own pair of shoes. So I'd be buying things at a really young age. There was no way my parents could afford to, to give me things. So things like bicycles, you know, when I was 14, 13, uh, they weren't giving any of that stuff to me. That was, that had to be entirely uh, money that I'd saved myself. So I, I did recognize early on that money didn't grow on trees. And that's a blessing, Justin. Like when you, if you live in a family where, you know, many people will think, well, it's unfortunate that I don't have parents who can help me out and, and give me money and pay perhaps for more of my schooling and give me a car when I turn 16 or 17. But, but it's actually a blessing that they don't. Um, it's one of the reasons why wealth doesn't pass three generations. There's a generation that builds wealth. The second generation typically cons- preserves it or conserves it. And third generation typically squanders it just because they don't build those money muscles. So when I was paying for my own college, I had a part-time job and one of the mechanics I worked with, it was in a garage. My job was to fuel buses, like to drive these buses through an automated bus wash after the, the city buses would come in after their shift. So it was a night, it was a night job that I had and then drive them through, get them washed and park them. So I was what they call a serviceman. And this was my summer job and we worked in conjunction with some of the mechanics there. So if there was an issue, we'd take, you know, a bus into the garage and over the pit. And the mechanics were sort of people that would be telling us what to do. And one day, one of the mechanics told me, hey, there's this mechanic over there, that guy over there, his name is Russ. And if he ever wants to talk to you about money, make sure you listen to him. And I said, well, why? Why would I listen to that guy? And he said, because he's a self-made millionaire. And he didn't win the lottery and he didn't, he didn't get rich with some hot stock. That guy's just got some solid systematic methods that he's applied for a really long time. And yeah, he's a self millionaire. And so what, you know, eventually that guy Russ started to chat with me and he asked me what I would do if he gave me $10,000. And I thought he was going to give me money. I'm like, oh my gosh, the millionaire's about to give me money. And I said, well, I, I guess I'd put it towards my student law. I put towards my studies. Um, and he told me about a year later that if I said that I was going to buy a new stereo or I'd, I'd take some trip with that money, he said that he probably wouldn't talk to me again unless he had to. So he wanted to see how receptive I would be towards receiving some kind of financial education. And he started to give me financial education bit by bit over that summer, teaching me about the merits of compound interest, um, teaching me how new cars depreciate so rapidly. And that unless I'm rich, I should never buy a new car. He said, unless you're rich, you should never buy a new car. Financially, it doesn't make any, it doesn't make financial sense. So he taught me things about how, what to look for when purchasing a older, low mileage used vehicle and taught me that if I invested money early, I wouldn't need to invest as much. So I could save less than my friends. If I started early, I could save less than them over a lifetime, but still end up with more money. So for me, this was super inspiring for a couple of different reasons. One, of course, I never had any money because I never grew up with it. And the idea that I could get money working for me so I didn't have to work as hard for money was super inspiring because there was a part of me that was pretty lazy. Like, oh, I don't want to be working forever for money. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, that, that, that was the, the backstory in a nutshell. Uh, man, I find that story so fascinating. Again, um, my listeners have heard this time and time again, but I think it bears repeating. The, <clears throat> the most commonality, the co- most commonality between all of the people I talk to who do hard things successfully is that they have what I like to call a good sponsor network, either a strong team around them that really cares about them, friends, family, whatever, or there is a mentor at a crucial moment giving a hand down and then kind of, you know, that relationship benefiting you. And in this case, you know, it, it, it feels like uh, Morpheus on the matrix, you know, or Obi-Wan Kenobi, you know, reaching out and, finding the hero and being like hey here's an opportunity and you took it which is uh you could write a book about that just that story alone which i think is so cool 
um, <clears throat> not everyone has experiences like that. Some of us are, you know, in our 20, 20s, about to turn 28, and are still trying to grow our money muscles, not naming any names or anything. But um, if you if you could give just a few pieces of advice, obviously read your book, because that's a great place to start. Um, but just a few pieces of advice to say, hey, this is how you start going to the money gym, start working out your money muscles. And maybe you're not going to become an Olympian, but here's how you start getting your financial health on track. I'll, I'll give you the advice that is something that I've been doing for years. And I think it's the most important element to, to building wealth. And no one does it. Like virtually no one does it. Maybe like, I'm going to guess probably one in a hundred people do this. And it's track everything you spend with an app, every everything you make and everything you spend. So if you have, it's really easy. I used to do it with um, like a little booklet. So before the tech phase, you know, piece of paper and a, book, a little booklet for the year. And I would write down exactly what I spent every day and exactly what I would earn. And now it's so much easier because you can use an app for your phone, download it. You can categorize it so you can see what you're spending. And what ends up happening is you become accountable for what it is that you're spending money on. And you end up seeing where you might be wasting money on things that don't actually give you value things that don't give you a lot of satisfaction and you were looking at them going, am I really spending that much money on blank every month or every year? And so it's super important. A lot of people will say, well, I don't need to do that because my visa calculates everything. That is not the same thing. That is not the same thing. If I go to a store and I buy a chocolate bar, I will enter it immediately in my app and I categorize it under treats. So I, I physically enter it and it takes like 10 seconds, not even, but immediately that chocolate bar is now categorized. At the end of the month, I can see all of those categories. And what will happen, Justin, it happens on a, on a, well, a conscious level is that when we go to purchase something, knowing that we are consistently writing them down or documenting these things, it makes us fully accountable and makes us realize, wait a second here, hmm. Maybe I'm not going to go out for dinner again um, tonight because I can see how much I've spent so far on dinners this month and it's a little much. So I'm going to abstain from that. If you're not documenting your expenses, um, you're not running an efficient ship, no matter what. And, and I don't care what anyone says. You're just not like a business has to do that. Like a business will know where all of its where all of its expenses are. They calculate their income, they calculate their expenses, but almost no people do. And so it's one of those things that I think, you know, we really ought to be taught that in school. Like we need to track our income and our expenses. Um, weight Watchers did an interesting study to see what variable allowed people to lose weight most effectively. You know, was it exercise and was it diet? The single greatest variable was actually tracking what they ate. Because by tracking it, it builds in a level of accountability, much like the spending does. And so when you see how, how much you're spending, or at least when you're tracking your spending, you, you will end up spending less, just like those people, Weight Watchers, who are documenting their food, they end up eating less. And so in doing that, you can see how much it actually really does cost you to live. And you can figure out, well, what is it that I'm actually earning? And how much of it now can I end up putting away to save for my future. And you can have that money come out like a tax. So that money could go into an IRA immediately, or it could go towards, you could set up an automatic, like more aggressive automatic deposit into a debt reduction plan, something like that, which helps you financially move forward. But yeah, tracking the expenses is definitely the most important first step. Wow. <laughs> That was, uh, at least for me personally, super, super motivating. One, one thing that you said that kind of struck me was you categorize your, uh, your expenses, which I think is super useful because, you know, I, I keep a budget um, and I, I've seen how when I kind of run a tally of expenses over the last week, there's a lot of things that happen to fall into the other category and that other category just gets really <laughs> big and amorphous. So I think categorizing it is, is a really good, <laughs> a good step in that as well. 
um you want to say something no no i, I was just i was just laughing because the the other category we get that we we ended up building categories as we went so when yeah. we first got our when we first got our apps it was like okay so we we you know we have five or six categories or whatever we had but then you realize well wait a second what category does this fall into <laughs> well we might as well not put it under other let's create right. another category so right. um so my wife actually had it for her so my wife likes wine mm -hmm. and i don't drink but she likes wine she wanted to know like how much am i spending on wine so she actually <laughs> has a category on our phone that's awesome. for wine <laughs> that, that that's awesome and and th that just shows how personalized each person's budget needs to be in the categories and things because you know you, you spend money on what you value or you know you spend money on what you don't value and you don't get any value from it but that's a that's a whole nother conversation andrew I, I i'm afraid we've come down to the end of our time together uh this was such a great conversation uh we could probably talk for a whole lot longer but i don't want to take up too much of your night um, before we let you go, we need to know how can our audience reach out to you, see what you're up to and engage with you. Well, my website at andrewhallam.com. That's where I post my articles that I write. And there's a on Millionaire Teacher, they could find me, uh, sorry, they could find me also on Facebook at Millionaire Teacher. So I've got a Facebook group there. So if you're interested in joining that, you can ask me questions there, uh, tag me in, and I'll do my best to respond. And yeah, I think that would be uh, that would be about it. Perfect. Um, and then we also need to give our audience some action items. Uh, here's the list I came up with based on what we talked about in our conversation. Number one, focus on controlling your attitude. Number two, give more charity in order to build connections. Oh, sorry, connection with people, uh, multiple people. Uh, and number three, create and achieve stepping stone goals. I noticed that you talked about creating small goals, reaching those small goals, and then creating more. And then number four is track everything you make and everything you spend. Would you like to add to that list at all? That's a really good list. I, I just wanted to mention too that on my website at andrewhelm.com, I have a I have a, a, a sign up for anyone that purchases our pre orders my book balance which actually comes out january 18th but anybody pre-orders that before january 18th um if they email us a receipt and there's there are steps along the way to show what you know what email address but if they could take a screenshot email us a receipt uh they'll be invited to an exclusive session where i'll be talking about the the 10 uh the 10 most important tips to success that I've experienced in, in my life and sharing some anecdotal stories and blending them with the behavioral based evidence. Excellent. I will get that up on the show notes. Um, make sure audience you do reach out and engage. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much, Andrew, for being here on the show. Uh, I really appreciate it. And uh, I appreciate you sharing your experiences and, and teaching me personally and, and definitely our audience as well. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure, Justin. It was a pleasure to be on your show. Thank you very much. Thank you guys for listening to today's episode. Let me ask you one quick question. Do you like listening to the Hard Thing Podcast? If you said yes, uh, I would ask, is there anything you're willing to do to support our mission? If your answer is yes, then a simple thing that you can do is just leave a rating and review wherever you listen to podcasts. Or share the show with someone you know. That goes tremendously far. Uh, I know I ask for this a lot, but I, I seriously appreciate all the help you give in that area. Uh, next, again, as always, I'd like to encourage you guys to go over to OURrescue.org and get involved with my favorite nonprofit organization, Operation Underground Railroad. They go undercover to rescue kids from sex trafficking, which is dangerous, but also saintly work. And the biggest thing they need right now is just more awareness. So go to OURrescue.org, just spend a few minutes reading about what they do, and that will go even farther than leaving me a review. Uh, again, if you guys love the show, go to thehardthingpodcast.com and get some merchandise. We have shirts, hoodies, hats, uh, phone cases, backpacks, all sorts of things, and rep the brand everywhere. Uh, thank you guys so much, and uh, I hope you guys have an excellent week. We'll be back on Monday for our next amazing show. Until then, 
keep doing hard things because you will overcome average.